Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ to this special day when we commemorate his resurrection. Could we say together the words in bold type at the top of your order of service? The Lord is risen. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. I think we can say it better than that. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's sing to the Lord's praise, Christ the Lord is risen today. our hearts together in prayer. Alleluia, we serve our risen Saviour. We welcome you, Lord Jesus, into our lives, into our families, into our communities, and into our world. Living God, on this most joyous day, we offer our thanks and praise to you, creator of heaven and earth creator and lover of all humanity, for the precious gift of your Son, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. What a Saviour! We think of the cheers of the crowds on Palm Sunday to the jeers of the same people on Good Friday. But today, we are filled to overflowing with love that our Lord Jesus has defeated death and is here among us today. 
Out of the darkness of grief and despair comes a message of hope. Christ is risen indeed. <clears throat> we gather this morning as a community of believers. We come with joy to greet one another and to tell again the amazing news, Christ is risen. You have given us new life in the name of your Son. May our singing, praying, listening and proclaiming be a testimony to the power of your love to make us a new creation as a community of faith. We pray that the Easter light of life, hope and joy will live in us each day and that we will be bearers of that light into the lives of others. Gracious God, we praise you for the light of new life made possible through Jesus. We praise you for the light of new life that shone on the first witnesses of resurrection. We praise you for the light of new life that continues to shine in our hearts today. Lord, we know we will face difficulties in this world, but we are assured of the words you spoke to the disciples. To take heart, you have conquered the world, and so we face each day with confidence that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. We bring all our prayers to you now, Lord, in the words Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Could we have the first illustration, please? And the next one. Now that is... Uh, that's a woman called Eost. Actually, she doesn't really exist. That's the pre-Christian goddess of the spring. And can you see the wee bunny rabbit there beside her? That's just an illustration. But uh, we unthinkingly pay tribute to her all the time at this time of year. Because you see the connection between her name and... So what, what we've all been saying is <coughs> happy springtime. Happy springtime. Because she was the goddess of the festival of spring. And all the chocolate eggs and all the rest of it were actually... Even we who are supposed to be Christians, we can't find the words to say happy resurrection day. What a mouthful that is, eh? We say happy Easter. All the shops are full of stuff. It's even on the television news from time to time. Easter. And that's what it's about. It's about her. And the background is the non-Christian spring festival uh, uh, which goes back, Kara, it goes back 600 years before Jesus. And they rolled eggs then and painted them then as well. So these things about the eggs, the egg is an ancient non-Christian symbol of, of new birth, of course. The Easter bunny never existed. And people like to have a festival of the springtime, which you can understand, but we never, ever changed the name. And what we should be celebrating is the festival of Jesus' resurrection. That's the words we should be using 
And that's what should be on all our literature and the publicity. That's all the greetings. I know it's harder to say, but I would love you to stop saying Happy Easter and say Happy, just say, cut it short, Happy Jesus Resurrection Day or Happy Festival of Jesus Resurrection because that's what it's really about. And see how he gets marginalized still on his day of resurrection. He's still put to the back. And you have chocolate eggs and Easter bunnies and her. <laughs> A mythical goddess. Could we have the next? <laughs> you know who that is? Stop it. Aye, that's right. <laughs> you think he's a real person? No. no. Did somebody say yes. And the goddess of the spring and Dobby are of the same character and quality. They're works of fiction. They don't exist. They're of the next. But Jesus did live and did die. And it's recorded in the Roman historians and Josephus, the Jewish historian, that he died in 29 AD, apart from the testimonies of the Gospels. So he was a real person. He wasn't like her, and he wasn't like Dobby. He was a real person, documented in human history. The next picture, please. And here we are then. He lived in history. We exist today to witness to his resurrection, and that's one of the illustrations, a photograph of an empty tomb. And our great calling and witness is the resurrection of Jesus, our Savior. I think John is coming to do the intimation. Good morning and happy Easter. There are a Were you not listening? <laughs> happy Resurrection Day. Happy <laughs> I'll get my coat. There are a very few intimations uh, this morning. First of all, to point out that the term time activities have ceased over the Easter holidays. The, uh, there is a special Easter viewing tonight of the Christian film Against the Tide, uh, here in the church tonight at 7 p.m. Admission is free. Refreshments and popcorn will be available in the vestibule. There's a retiring collection to defray expenses. Uh, come along and fetch your friends, it says here. Uh, all are welcome. This, is, uh, this film features Professor John Lennox, who's a professor of mathematics at Oxford University, philosopher of science, writer, and uh, very renowned speaker, a serious man with a serious message. It is a wonderful film and the title refers to his stand against the tide of atheism, if you like, and it shows amongst other things that the universe was designed. It does contain some challenging views, but Professor Lennox deals with these with patience and aplomb and evidence-based logic. I saw the film on Wednesday night. I found it to be a fascinating documentary. I commend it to you, so uh, please come along to that tonight. We will now stand and sing together at Mission Praise 1105. See what a morning.
Our Bible reading for today comes from John's Gospel, John chapter 20, verses 1 to 29. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said to him, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look in the, into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realise it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was a gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and she told them, 
he said that he had said these things to her. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were all to get, were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came in and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and said, The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and, and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord, but he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger where the nails were, put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Amen. Let us pray. On this day of your resurrection, Lord Jesus, we worship, praise, and bless you from our hearts. We thank you that your kingdom is not of this world, nonviolent, above the fray of politics and wars, battles and conflicts, eternal and blessed. We pray for your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. We rejoice with all who acknowledge your resurrection throughout the world, and we pray for those who suffer for doing so in North Korea, China mainland, and Hong Kong. We pray for the members, men, women, and children of the persecuted churches of Africa, Cameroon, Mauritania, Northern Nigeria, Burkina Faso, Mali, Chad, Sudan, Congo, Mozambique, and throughout the continent. We pray for the harassed Christians of Pakistan and India, for those wrongfully imprisoned, some for years without trial. We pray for the Christians of the Middle East and of the Holy Land, forced from their homes and livelihoods, who have emigrated for safety's sake and a better life. We pray for those who remain in the Holy Land, guarding the sacred spaces, witnessing for Jesus, keeping his peace. We pray, O Lord, for the lost souls of our own nation and people, for the failing Christian leadership of the land, for many church members of little faith, confidence, belief, and hope, some even who are among us here today. Strengthen, increase, and empower your faithful remnant, O Lord, we pray, and include us among them. And against all the odds, bring revival to New Farm Loch, for we pray for every soul, in every home, on every street. Dear Lord, on this very special anniversary, we pray for our own nearest and dearest be they near or far. We remember long departed loved ones. And we pray for those who we know are unwell and in pain in body, mind, soul, and spirit. And we pray for each other, Lord. We do what we can. It could be better. 
Fan the flames of our faith into the pleasant spiritual fire of Pentecost, we pray. Inspire our hearts, lighten our minds, renew our youth like the eagles, and grant us rejoicing today of all days and always. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's sing, Now is Christ risen from the dead. Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Simon Greenleaf was born in 1783 and died in 1853. He became the founder and leader of the Harvard Law School in America. And he was a renowned authority on the rules of evidence in courts, and he published a book on that great subject. Some of his students challenged him to apply his principles uh, to uh, the resurrection uh, of Jesus. 
he himself had been and continued as an atheist and was wholly skeptical, skeptical about the truth of the stories of resurrection. But he agreed to take up the challenge, and he did what his students asked of him. And by the time he had completed his studies, he published a book, Explanation of the Testimonies of the Four Evangelists, based on the principles of justice, principles of evidence active in the courts of justice. And he was converted. He became a Christian, and he witnessed for Jesus Christ to the rest of his days. There's a chap called Albert Morris. He was born in 1881. He became a journalist and a writer. And he was agnostic, and he was skeptical about Christianity and especially about the resurrection. And he decided he would write uh, an article to be published which ended the whole story at Jesus' death and showed that the resurrection was false. He uh, also did the studies, and he also changed his mind completely. And he was converted and became a Christian. And he published a book under a pseudonym, and you'll know this book, some of you, Frank Morrison, who rolled the stone away. That's him. Now, not of many of us meet the risen Jesus Christ like St. Paul did. Saul of Tarsus as was. And we are obliged in this day and age of ours to give evidence as much as we can, an explanation for what we believe about Jesus, that he rose from the dead. And we are told that you have to prove it in a laboratory. You have to prove it scientifically, or else we don't want to believe it, and we're not going to. But Christian testimony has the status of legal testimony in a court of law. And legal testimony in a court of law is extraordinarily powerful because it provides evidence for the conviction of people for crimes or it absolves them and lets them go home. And some of the sentences are long, long prisons and still in some countries a death sentence. So legal testimony is a very powerful thing in our society. And it's based on evidence toward proof. And Christian testimony about Jesus Christ has that quality and has that status. We don't all live in laboratories anyway. We don't wear white coats. We don't have wee machines we're working on. I'm not belittling it. It's just that there is another dimension to evidence and proof. And we can claim the status of legal testimony. And some people, as Christians, know that for sure because they're in court for being Christians in some places in the land. There's another aspect also. The whole academic enterprise of the social sciences, we know them as sociology and psychology, historical studies, there's all sorts of them. They are always producing reports and explanations and data about things visible and active in the human community all over the world. And it's held to be academically respectable. And there's courses in all the universities. And government is based on all the data that these people produce. And here, we as Christians can produce our social evidence for our faith. We can provide the data of 2,000 years of good works, of contributions to humanity. And so we don't live in laboratories. We can't prove in a laboratory that Jesus rose from the dead. But that's not to belittle our witness because we can testify legally that Jesus is risen from the dead. 
And we can show in all the data of the best of Christianity throughout 2,000 years that it works and that it is good for humanity. What was it then that changed Simon Greenleaf and uh, Frank Morrison as they became into believers? Well, the standard answer to this is, first of all, that Jesus actually did die. Because there was a story and a rumor that he didn't actually die. He fainted. And in the cold air of the tomb, he revived. But when we read in John 19, 33, 34, it says they came to him and he was already dead. And one of the soldiers thrust a spear into the side uh, of his body. And out came water and blood. And according to medical reports, that's the plural fluid in the lung and the blood coming out the right ventricle of the heart in that order. A sign and symptom and evidence of a body already dead. The grave, of course, was empty. Now, the Jewish leaders knew where it was. They knew who owned it and they could get in touch with them. They never ever came to the grave to get the body of Jesus they didn't believe was resurrected, get it and drag it through the streets back to the te temple steps, put it on the temple steps and say, well, there you are. There's your risen Messiah. There he is. They never did that. They could have done if it had been so, as they would have wished. There's a story that uh, the disciples stole the body out of the grave and hid him and reburied him. In fact, it's in Matthew's gospel. The temple guards went back to tell the chief priest the grave's, the grave's empty. And they were told, well, here's some money. You just say that the disciples stole it and we'll keep you right if it ever gets to, uh, to Pilate. And uh, that's an interesting one too. It doesn't make any sense that the disciples would then spend the rest of their lives saying that Jesus is alive and resurrected. They would be telling a lie. Next, you'll know, of course, that it was three women that found and first knew that Jesus was alive. And they went back, and the disciples didn't believe them. And you wouldn't found a faith on that, because women at that time did not have a legal status to make a testimony about anything. So the fact that it's there is absolutely 100% authentic, that these women were the first people to meet the risen Jesus, and they were the first people to proclaim the gospel that Jesus is alive, and we have met him. And in Acts 1.14, it says, they were all together constantly praying, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Now, we know that Mary gave her testimony to Luke to write about how Jesus has been born. And we know he was, she was there at uh, the crucifixion. And here is Mary, Jesus' mother, a Christian in the first Christian church and community. Then you have what is called the group witness test in history. If one person says something in history... There's no proof of it. If something happens repeatedly, and if it's experienced by a group of people together, it is regarded in historical studies and as authentic evidence of truth. It says in Acts 1, Jesus gave many convincing proofs. But Paul is the man who explains it very clearly in 1 Corinthians 15, 6. Jesus appeared first of all, to Peter and to the twelve. 
and to 500 of them, and then to James and to the apostles, and lately, latterly, abnormally to me. He meant by that that he was a co-opted apostle. He had not been one of the original twelve. And Peter says in Acts 10, 39, we saw it all, we saw it all. And they killed him by hanging him on a tree, and he rose again, and we have met him. He did not appear to everybody. He appeared to those who were called to witness. And that's us. And we are called to witness to Jesus' resurrection. Well, there's lots of fiction. We're surrounded by it every day. Think of all the characters of contemporary fiction. You've got uh, Superman and Wonder Woman, Spider-Man, James Bond, haven't you? You've got Harry Potter and Hermione and uh, Kismet, uh, Kismet Everdeen and Layla and all of these people. None of them will ever found a living faith in people's hearts that lasts for centuries and millennia. Not even the ancient Greek gods and goddesses survived their heroes, Hercules, Odysseus, all the rest of it, and her that we saw earlier too. So it's all very true and it's all very strong and it's all authentic. And we don't need to be blackmailed into being quiet and silenced and embarrassed to believe that Jesus is risen from the dead. Now, plenty of academics in the universities teaching ministers over the years have not believed that Jesus rose from the dead. When I was at college, I just got there. We were told, when you go into your second year, you'll get Ronald Gregor Smith, the professor of theology, and his opening marks, remarks in his first lecture are, the bones of the man Jesus are rotting somewhere in Palestine. And I was kind of dreading this. How would I cope with, with this? And that summer, before I went due to go into my second year, he died suddenly. He was only in his 50s. And I breathed a sigh of relief for myself, selfishly, or spiritually, maybe. And... Another person was, was given that job who didn't have such extreme views. And we know there are church leaders who don't really believe that Jesus rose from the dead. They, ah, it was a vision. They had psychological, it, it was. One of them was John Shelby Spong. He was another of these Anglican bishops who didn't believe anything. He died in 2021. And... Um, he said, oh no, it couldn't possibly be a physical resurrection. There was an interesting letter in the Herald on the 19th of March from a chap called Ken Mackay. I am a lifelong atheist, but I am from a religious family. I lost my sister recently to cancer, and I saw what a comfort and solace her faith and her prayers and her belief in her resurrection were to her. And though I couldn't share it, I commended, I commended her for it. And he wrote a letter to the Herald about that. So, the new atheist Christopher Hitchens, the arrogance of these people, he said, ah, religion is outmoded. It doesn't offer any explanations for anything relevant now. In fact, all it's doing is holding us back. So now I ask you to consider what abandoning Christianity has done to this country of ours. What do you see around you? People, large numbers of people, unwell, Two million after COVID not going back to work. The quarters apparently saying they have mental health problems. Some undoubtedly will have. 
There's a lack of morale in the country, a lack of purpose. People are depressed. And children in schools are anxious. There's a petty lawlessness now and the police are not even bothering to arrest people. What has become of this once Christian country? You'd say that society and marriage has fallen apart. That's what happens when you take Christianity out of a whole nation, culture, and people, and hemisphere, because all over the West. And now we're afraid, because against all the odds, Russia has risen up again. And Putin, lawless, sinful man that he is, uses and exploits Greek Orthodox Christianity to bolster his political message and himself. And his, his, his patriarch, Kirill, who supports him, he is expanding the influence of the Russian Orthodox Church throughout different countries in the world, including Africa, in a deliberate attempt to take on the residual Christianity of the, of the West and of colonialism in Africa. That is what is happening. And so, where do we stand in all of this? Well, we have to stand with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have uh, the calling to stand up against this in two ways. The two things, the proof and the data. The proof is the testimony that Jesus Christ is alive, the gospel that we proclaim. That is what we must stand up for. That is the first commandment in the scriptures. And the second is we provide the humanity, the good works, anything and everything that we may do that will be a blessing and help to our fellow human beings wherever we are sent. So there is our proofs of the resurrection. But we must proclaim and our church has to have that as the highest activity and goal of our existence. And we must serve our fellow human beings as best as we can. And in that way, we fulfill providing the evidence and the proofs in this day and age that Jesus Christ, our Lord, is indeed risen from the dead. Now let's close this service then with the great hymn, Thine Be the Glory. <clears throat>
peace and in the power of Jesus' resurrection and the blessing of the living God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and with those whom you love today and forevermore.